You know, without getting into the details of exactly how that happened or how she got it out, let's just say it was a bad situation. And she panicked because, like for many of us, her phone is one of the most used and essential tools in her life. But, on the other hand, she had no idea how to fix it, because it's a completely mysterious black box. So, think about it, what would you do? What do you really understand about how your phone works? What are you willing to test or fix? For most people, the answer is, nothing. There are some 250 million cars in America, 250 million cars in the country, with just over 300 million people. And most of those vehicles, of course, are gas-powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of oil and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there is good news, according to our guests today. And that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek, fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels, and digital technology. And they already exist, so what's stopping us from putting them on the roads? Our guests today will help answer that. You've heard about SARS, AIDS, and bird flu. Now researchers from Australia claim we're about to be hit by a new epidemic, motivational deficiency disorder. According to the British Medical Journal, one in five people are said to suffer from motivational deficiency disorder, or MOTID, and most don't even know they have it. Symptoms include being unable to get out of bed in the morning, being trapped on the couch. Obviously, this is all relevant to your final assignment. So we're going to talk about it. So until today, we've gone through face-to-face -face interviews as the main sort of part of interviewing the window. Today we're going to have a look at going to use an email and why they work, why they don't necessarily work, and what are the challenges and some of the things that we need to be understanding, you know when we are completing such interpreters. So let's start with the foreign one. Obviously, there are a few benefits to them, and they are listed there up on that slide. It's obviously less stressful for those of you who might be a little bit anxious about interviewing. Dams are huge man-made structures that act as barriers on a river. Today, the main reason people build dams is to produce electricity. They are also built to restrict and control the flow of water in a river. Throughout history, dams have been used to prevent flooding and to irrigate farmland. Dams supply about a sixth of the world's electricity and they significantly reduce the risk of floods and droughts. They also make water easier to access, especially in desert-like areas, where water is in low supply. There are however, some negative effects of damming rivers. Many people's homes are knocked down to make space for the dam, and flooding can occur in the reservoir, which is the area behind the dam where water collects. 
This can cause valuable farmland to become submerged under the lakes. Another way in which the industry exerts pressure on doctors is by offering us a variety of professional services. In one of these services, widely advertised to GPs, a company representative shows the practice manager how to use a company disk to trawl through the practice database identifying patients with problems which might be treatable with the company's products. When that has been done, a company-sponsored nurse interviews the selected patients and draws up a management plan for the GP which, if approved by the doctor, attracts a Medicare item number. One of these companies proudly announces that over 65,000 patients were assessed in this way in 2005. What, one may ask, is a pharmaceutical company doing assessing patients? It is surprising that no government or professional body has stepped in to prevent this commercially sponsored program. It is about a hundred years since that great Canadian-born physician Sir William Osler, Regius Professor of Medicine in Oxford, complained about the increasing influence of the pharmaceutical industry on the medical profession. He would be turning in his grave at the way the industry now dominates doctors' prescribing habits. It does this not only by direct and indirect pressure on the doctors themselves, but also by encouraging the public to ask for scripts. And one particular crop, almond in the US, and now in Australia, is transforming the world of beekeeping and of bees. What has happened is that something serendipitous came along that people found out, that doctors found out that almonds are good for you, a confection, but it's good for you. The almond board got a very aggressive promotion, going on for almonds. They actually, I just heard recently, send out sales reps to cardiologists at hospitals to promote the heart benefits of almonds. In a very good promotion of almonds, and it's legitimate promotion because they are a healthy food. Green chemistry is a concept designed to develop technologies which allow chemistry to be practiced with minimal damage to the environment or in an environmentally compatible way. And it's meant to cover both chemical processes and chemical products. The center, if you would, set up about seven or eight years ago, and the idea was to provide a hub of activities that covered fundamental research work, industrial collaboration, but also educational developments. So we work with schools and on public projects as well, and also networking. So we network out to well over 1,000 people around the globe. Well, the simple explanation might be that yesterday's sudden drop in share prices pretty much across the board has created what market analysts like to call a buying opportunity. It tends to bring out investors to pick through the ruins, 
looking for bargains decision by investors that sellers got a little carried away with things so the buyers have lifted all the major indexes today. The Dow, the Nasdaq, the S&P 500 were all up around half a percent in early trading today, and that wasn't a big surprise. The sell-off continued somewhat overseas European markets remain fairly weak, along with many of the Asian markets. But you'll remember that all this started with a big plunge of around 9% on the stock market in Shanghai. Well, Chinese rebounded by around 4%. Well, I'm absolutely delighted first of all to have been appointed to this professorship. The role is going to be about public engagement in science, it is about marketing science accessible to as wide an audience as possible, it's about making it easier for our academics here at the University of Birmingham to talk about their research to the general public and it's not just about a one-way flow of information, it very much is about dialogue. My current research at the moment is really quite broad. I work at the interface between the arts and humanities, particularly archaeology, but trying to find questions which are difficult to answer unless you start integrating computing and visualization so really, I work in this boundary between trying to understand cultural questions about the past, but those sorts of questions that you can't address unless you start reconstructing, start modeling and visualizing past landscapes objects and movement of people. Rebuilding carbon-rich agriculture soils is the only real productive, permanent solution to taking excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. She's frustrated that scientists and politicians don't see the same opportunities she sees. This year, Australia will emit just over 600 million tons of carbon. We can sequester 685 million tons of carbon by increasing soil carbon by half a percent on only 2% of the farms. If we increased it on all of the farms, we could sequester the whole world's emissions of carbon. These two paintings, both called sunflowers, are generally accepted as the finest of several depictions of the thick-stemmed, nodding blooms that Van Gogh made in 1888 and 1889 during his time in Alls. The first is now in the collection of the National Gallery in London, and the second is in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Van Gogh referred to this work as a repetition of the London painting. But art historians and curators have long been curious to know how different this repetition is from the first. Should it be considered a copy, an independent artwork or something in between? An extensive research project conducted over the past three years by conservation experts at both the National Gallery and the Van Gogh Museum has concluded that the second painting was not intended as an exact copy of the original example, said Ella Hendricks a professor of conservation and restoration at the University of Amsterdam, who was the lead researcher on the project.
Jack Nicholson, playing the crazed caretaker in The Shining, makes me reach for a blanket. Now a study finds that people we find, well, creepy can actually make us feel colder. The research will be published in the journal Psychological Science. Researchers interviewed 40 college undergraduates. During each interaction, the experimenter was either chummy with the student or very stiff and professional. The investigator also alternated between mimicking students' posture, a signal of rapport, and not doing anything at all. Participants then completed a questionnaire designed to find out how hot or cold they felt. The results showed that the subjects actually felt colder when the investigator acted inappropriately or sent mixed signals. The researchers conjecture that because the brain tries to interpret social cues and purely physical ones simultaneously people unconsciously associate icy stares and chilly interactions with actual physical coldness. So the next time you have to visit your doctor with the creepy receptionist, bring a sweater. An economist sees the world basically through a typical microeconomic toolkit. That involves things like thinking at the margin, rationality, opportunity cost, trade-offs. Economists like any other discipline rules, and its own way of seeing the world. So basically economics, or economists in general tend to apply microeconomic concepts like that to explain the way humans behave and to make predictions about the future. Finally, we take a look at how to mix and unmix liquids at the flick of a switch. Sandrine tells us more. Oil and water don't usually mix, but the new chemical sensitive to light has been added here to blend them together. When exposed to UV light, the chemical changes its structure and becomes soluble in water. This causes two layers to form with the oil floating on top of the water chemical combo. This method should be cheaper than the current alternative, which involves using high-energy centrifuges. What is nanotechnology? Well, a report that was put together by a combination of the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering that came out last summer, identifies two topics. Nanoscience is the study of phenomena and the manipulation of materials at atomic, molecular, and macromolecular scales, where properties differ significantly from those as a larger scale. Nanotechnologies are the design characterization, production and application of structures, devices, and systems by controlling shape and size at the nanometer scale. So I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about what a nanometer is, but loosely speaking people think of nanotechnologies as being a sort of 100 nanometers or less. Financial markets swung wildly yesterday in frenzied trading market by further selling of equities and fears about an unraveling of the global carry trade. At the same time trading in the European credit markets in London was exceptionally heavy as traders frantically reassessed their appetite for risk prompting wild swings in the prices of the key derivatives. It was the third day of frenetic activity in the European credit markets, 
suggesting that equity market swings were prompting a wider repositioning of investors in a host of asset classes. Along the way, we have built unashamedly beautiful buildings, two of which have won and been runner-up in the prestigious United Nations World Habitat Award, the first time an Australian building has received that international honour. We rely on older concepts of Australian architecture that are heavily influenced by the bush. All residents have private verandas which allow them to socialise outdoors and also create some defensible space between their bedrooms and public areas. We use a lot of natural or soft materials and build beautiful landscaped gardens.